Hi everybody. Let's see. Oh no! Oh, you did it the opposite. Way. Okay. It's fine. Oh. Yeah, so no, you're on there again. Okay. Now say hi everybody. Hi everybody. So happy you're here. Okay. It's Tisha B'Av, and I just want to first give a blessing that may all the years of uh, our fasting. Uh, turn into days of feast and rejoicing. There's a lot of noise. That's not loud. We'll be asking if there's a recording. Yeah, very loud. Yeah. So again, the blessing is that uh, all of our fasting will turn into days of feast and joy. Um, and a lot of rejoicing. So today is an auspicious day to reflect, to do tshuva, to give extra tzedaka, and to reach greater heights. And in mm. our being here together, learning about a Beit HaMikdash will be one, reconstructing the Beit HaMikdash up above, as well as reconstructing the Beit HaMikdash within. So that we can draw down the Zrat Hashem, the ultimate third of Beit HaMikdash. So we know that, you know, our own self is our own Beit HaMikdash. And for so many years and so many centuries, we're trying so hard to get to the next level, to get to the next level. And this class we're going to focus on the way the Beit HaMikdash is designed, the places in which each vessel is situated, as a message to us how to get to our Holy of Holies. Because each step along the way of the construction of the Beit HaMikdash is like messages, this is the first step, this is the second step, this is the third step, and so forth, to get to our own Holy Soul. Because we know Hashem wants to dwell within us. And by doing that, we'll be also listening to the messages of how to have better relationships with our children, with our spouse, and with the neighborhood and world at large. So our home is so, so needed to go to the next level as a therapist, as a counselor, I again and again and I hear so much desire and so much passion, L'Shem Shemaim, to get our children and to get sometimes our spouse to join forces to get to that next level. And many times, unfortunately, anger and frustration gets mingled in where then the results are not only not going forward, but unfortunately the opposite. So today is an appropriate time to learn about the Glorious Temple in order really to prepare ourselves um, and get to that amazing holy place. Now I'm going to show you on this billboard that I last minute put together because my one that I have at home is the one I uh, usually have. I said no I'm going to make one real quick so uh, and we're going to go through it right now. First of all, if you notice right over here is the structure of the Beit HaMikdash and in the area right over here is where the Chatser was. And in the Chatser you'll see is a Mizbeh. So we're first going to talk about um, this section right here. This chatzer, if you look in the Beit HaMikdash, uh, uh, is where all the sacrifices of the Mizbeach HaNechoshet. Uh, this Mizbeach HaNechoshet was considered very holy. If you look in the Tanakh, in comparison to the other Mizbeach, which was 
closer to the Holy of Holies, closer to where the Aaron was, was not considered very holy. So we're already getting a message here. The Chatzer is our outside. Chatzer is our outer behaviors. So it's critical that the number one step is to work on our outer behaviors. Because one, it influences people, especially in our home, especially in our relationship. Our thoughts, our speech, and our actions are all parts of us. But the first step to refine is our outside behavior. And the Mizbech and the Choshet is made out of Nechoshet, which is copper, and it comes from the word Nachash. It comes from the word the snake. Because it's our temptation to let the Yetzahara, the snake-like thoughts in our mind, to dictate how we're going to behave. But what we have to do is realize we got to really sacrifice that animalistic tendency of our behavior of going with anger and sadness and negativity in the house. So we learned that during the time of the Beit HaMikdash, when they brought these sacrifices, they would bring an animal. This is where the animal sacrifice was. And in Lukate Torah, the Altar Rebbe actually discusses what would they do? They would bring an animal according to their animalistic tendency. So if a person had a very lustful personality, they loved to eat, they had an addictive type of personality, they would bring the ox, the goring, uh, I'm sorry, the sheep. The goring ox was the uh, personality that related to someone who was angry or, you know, the mad type of personality. If someone had a cold, stubborn personality, they would bring a goat. So right now we don't have the Beit HaMikdash. We have tefillah. We have praying. And when we begin to pray, we're supposed to think, the first thing I have to do is I have to get rid of my animal. If I want to get to my Holy of Holies, I need to sacrifice these negative attributes about myself. So you can imagine yourself when you open your sitter to think, which animal would you bring? And then think like what would happen in the Beit HaMikdash. What happened in the Beit HaMikdash? A holy fire in the shape of a lion would come down and consume the sacrifice. So when we open the sitter and we pray this prayer, we can remind ourselves this is the first thing that we were doing in the Beit HaMikdash. This is the most holy. First and foremost is to get rid of the negative. Sur mira aseto. Meaning that you should get away from the bad, the not good, and then you'll be able to do the good. So in our relationship with our children and our family members, if our animal is getting in the way, then we won't be able to bond fully, holistically, with love. Because anger ends up coming out when we're trying to come close to guiding them. And then they'll reject our help, whether it's a husband or even a child. So even though this Mizbeach and the was not a prime metal like Zahav, it teaches us the message. So, you know, the Torah teaches us, don't use your righteousness for wickedness. Many people want to uphold all these stringencies. Shabbos is coming! And they yell, and they shame, and it's such a commotion, God forbid. So the righteousness ends up being snatched by the Sahara. The animal soul now is in charge, will be as if this is for religious fervor, but in the end, they're shaming and creating a disgust even, God forbid, for religion. If this is your God, then I don't want anything of it. 
There was a story in the Torah that teaches this lesson. When the Jewish people, during the time of Yehuda and the, and the 12 tribes, there's a story of Reuben. His mother was always the second in comparison to Racha. And he was always bothered, feeling bad about the honor of his mother. And then the Rachel actually passes away. And he thinks, Reuben thinks, now my mother is going to be next in honor. So what does he do? He ends up rashly with um, an emotion, an uncontrollable emotion, Rashi says, and moves the bed of his father. So in the merit, he thinks, in the uh, wanting to honor his mother, he ends up dishonoring his father. So again, it's something holy, something that worth trying to rectify because it's the mother, your mother, your honor of your mother. But in the end, if you look it up, because of that act, he loses his Yerusha, his kingship. He was supposed to be, the, through his lineage, the king Mashiach, the dynasty of Mashiach, and he loses his position as being in the Kahuna. And it, it went over to Yehuda. So we see the end act is what's important. I can just tell you there was a situation in my life where I actually entered somebody's home and uh, the person sitting at the table was reading schmutz, kind of, not something holy while they were eating. And, um, and, the, and the wife just came in, was so embarrassed. This is a mizbeach me'at, she says, in sarcasm but with a little tinge of anger, if not a lot more than that. Grabbed the newspaper and said, this is a mizbeach me'at, in front of me. Now she wanted to protect the holy table. Such a holy endeavor when we eat. But she shamed him in the act. God says, better erase my name than create such a shaming moment for the person. So that is the Mizbeach HaNechoshet. Now if we move along, you'll see there's the Kior here, right over here. And this next step is our preparation of now having gotten rid of our animal soul to get to the next level. Now, this next level kind of reminds you of when you're some fancy restaurants, they give you like some towelette to clean your hands, now you go to the next meal. Um, but it's interesting how this was made. This was made with also nechoshet, and it actually was the mirrors that were donated by the women during the time of the desert. And at the time, Moshe Rabbeinu did not want to accept them because these mirrors kind of to him symbolized the actual vanity. You know, mirrors, looking at yourself. But these women actually use these mirrors, the Shem Shamayim, to make sure that more babies would be born. So this represents, now that you've sacrificed your animal, your connection to your ego and your connection to your lustfulness, now you can use, you can begin to use the materialism for holiness. Like the mirrors were used for holiness. They wanted to make more babies. The men were tired and they thought, why should we, you know? Our kids were, uh, will be killed. And the women reminded them, the men, hello? The boys will be killed, but at least our women will survive. So Hashem said, no, these are the most precious dedicated physical substance of the Beit HaMikdash. And so Moshe Rabbeinu used it. Now, interesting, Nechoshet, Nechash. 
So we're trying to, instead of going with our, our Yetzirah for using the material in a not good way, we're trying to use the material in a good way and raise it up and make it holy. As a counselor, I really have heard so many stories of parents not being home. I used to live in Israel, and kids would get out of school 12-1, and they had to work till 7-8, and we had programs, after-school programs for these kids because there were nowhere to go. Parents weren't home. Thank God, we do live in a generation where we have food markets, like everything, they're ready. We don't have to plow, we don't have to reap, we don't have to sow, we don't have to do all the work, but somehow, we still have so much work. Somehow, even when we're trying to use our phones, the Shem Shemai, somehow, it's too many people, even in my generation and younger, telling me, I don't know what to do, I can't believe it, I'm always texting, I'm always WhatsApping, and yes, they want to send a shear, and yes, they want to invite people to this uh, event, and the list goes on of what could be done wholly with our phones. But I can just list two incidences that happened to me, seeing where are we getting to? And I see it happen again and again and again. I'm walking, and everybody's on the phone with their babies if they're with their babies and not a nanny. And the baby's going like this, and they're not paying attention. And I decided to like just watch. How long will they walk and not pay attention? Or how about the nanny that I see with the child not paying attention? I even went all the way to the home and I saw what happened. Other times I see through my different windows, people swinging the little kid and on the iPhone, and the baby's also wanting to go out, and I'm like, and I can't really get to that person, they're in another building, but I see the whole thing. It is a holy moment to send someone something, to reply, to do this, but come on, not at the expense of our children, not at the expense of bonding and uniting with our loved ones. How many people go to restaurants? And everyone's on their phone. Oh, no, no, just this. Oh, but we have to do that. Who says? It could have maybe waited 10 minutes. Or maybe go to the bathroom. Do it there. You know, so it doesn't look so obvious if it has to be done. When you're there, be present. So let's use our material endeavors, L'Shem Shemaim. So next, if you notice, is um, right over here, the shulchan. And the shulchan, oh, I'm sorry, we're at this one. See, I know this one over here, the uh, Mizbeah Ha. Ha Ketoris. And this actually represents our next step. So we first are trying to sacrifice and pray that when, since we don't have the Beit HaMikdash now, we're praying, we're thinking about our animal that we want to sacrifice. We can even envision the big lion coming down, consuming our negativity. Next, we prepare ourselves by engaging in the physical, the Shem Shemayim. And now we get to the Mizbeach HaKetoros. Now, this Mizbeach was um, uh, a moment in time where it was solitude with Hashem. The Kohen would come in and there would be a bonding. The, this was a time of bonding between Hashem. Mm -hmm. And it was also a, t uh, a sacrifice used in times of danger. Because if you remember, when Moshe Rabbeinu and the whole issue with, with uh, Korah, uh, Hashem told Moshe to tell Aaron, do the offering uh, of the Ketoros, to protect the people. If you notice in your Siddur, there's also that prayer, which is just as effective for 
for security and safety. So like if some people only have a few prayers to say, many say this is one of the most important prayers for protection. And um, this Mizbeach actually represents the, um, the effusion and the scent of these practices of, of, um, of this altar was of the like amazing spiritual energies going up and that's why the, it's called the reach nichoach of this sacrifice. There was a, a beautiful smell that was descending, representing our mitzvot. The things we do down here, we bond with Hashem, and our mitzvot go up and up and up to the higher worlds, changes the strict din of Shemaim, and then makes them turn into chasadim and brings goodness down to our life. And that's what gives us security. So in order to allow our mitzvahs to go up, we have to realize first is the prayer, because as the Tanya teaches us, our prayers allow our mitzvahs to ascend. If you don't do the first step and you don't pray and you do mitzvahs, then you did not build a ladder. You didn't go up this ladder with your mitzvot to reach Hashem. And then the byproducts of all of your efforts don't as much come down into your life. So imagine a beautiful flowery uh, vase of and it's, the smell is so amazing and you know someone enters your house and from the entrance they smell it so we are taught here that not only do we our mitzvahs bring goodness and kindness and chasadim into our life but it gets penetrated to all of the higher worlds and then penetrates the whole world not only to Jews literally goyim become closer to Hashem through our doing our mitzvahs Literally, our family members get closer to Hashem. There was a story of a man who, it was in Siberia, and he, in those days, uh, it was very, very difficult to celebrate Sukkot. There would be hidden places far, far away that they would build to be able to uh, get to the, the Sukkah, and it would, it would, it would be extremely cold. And this happened to my friend's great-grandfather. And she told me this story. I heard it personally from her. And uh, it was a dangerous time. And in the middle of the night, he got very, very thirsty and felt he had to go get a drink of water. And Chabad custom is that you don't have to, but you do the extra mile and go the extra way to not even drink in... Uh, and but in for the sukkah. So what happened? His friend standing by saying, "What are you doing? It's dangerous. You're gonna, you, you can be caught here." But he went. And as he was going, he said, "No, no, it's dangerous." He goes, "This is for the chinuch of my children." He says, "But your children are not here to see this." He goes, "No, they do. Their soul will feel this. It will be to their merit." Happened to be that he did go. And the KGB did come in, in his house, and he happened to be in the sukkah, and, and thank God they didn't find him, and they left. So it literally saved his life. And, uh, and his kids, and, and his children, and his grandchildren are amazing, I know them. Amazing, holy, halika people. So it did impact them, and it impacted the whole world. So that time that we have a challenge, that we don't feel like going the extra mile. Sometimes it's a person that didn't treat us so nicely that day. And it's the night of the mikvah, right? Our husband. Or sometimes it's an incident with our children. And we feel like, why should I? Like, look how they behaved to me yesterday. And we shut down and we don't do it. But in reality, if we went the extra mile, that's the extra... Zuchos, 
that will influence them and get them closer to Hashem. So we can't make the cheshbon. We have to know that there are things we can't feel. We can't put our hands on like the effect of this effusion of this sacrifice it went up to Shemaim and had such a direct effect that it actually helped stop the plague when there was the rebellion of Korah. So we can go to the next one and after that is the Shulchan which is right here and if you notice that the, there were 12 pieces uh, baked loaves of bread and they kept fresh from week to week and um, the way this table des is designed is also a message for us there was not a lack of property not like Manhattan where everything is stacked up you know? so what is this design of this these showcase bread being stacked up basically it's a message that we don't have to be arrogant we don't have to show off we don't have to like uh, uh, you know show our wares and, and uh, especially in regards to um, the way our thoughts our speech and our actions you know when Hashem came to save the Jewish people from Mitzrayim he came by himself and he could have come with a big army of hosts of angels but he wanted to come in modestly. He wanted to do it humbly. So when we speak, there's the arrogant way. You know, we know better. You know, we can speak condescendingly, God forbid, to our children. You know, I know better, just listen to me kind of energy. Or even with our husbands, where we're supposed to honor our husbands like, uh, uh, like a child that honors their parents so the more meek humble goes a long way because if you notice in the studies that the bread that they ate it was just a little piece so little but it satisfied them it satiated them it, it really impacted their sustenance so that is also another message Let's not run after Gashmut. Let's not burn our relationships because we're so exhausted. We have no patience. We're so irritable because we have to wake up at four in the morning and, da -da -da, and, and, and craziness at the expense of our relationships. I'm telling you, there's a lesson to be learned here. And trust me, I hold on to it. I've been on my own journeys in parenting and relationships uh, and uh, even with a master's degree of psychology and child development and, and years and years I'm trying my best it's not easy but as I've been studying over the years it's gotten better and better but one of the things that I studied is when the Jewish people got the man Mishamayim and it says that the, for the tzaddikim it was at the door and it said that the Rashaim got it at the end of the cities and the Benanim got it in the middle of the city. So according to the level you were at was how much you had to exert yourself. Well, there's, uh, I could say, eh, but that's just one, uh, one uh, interpretation. The other interpretation is as follows. More than that could be a lesson for us. Everyone got it at their doorstep. But what happened? The tzaddik sighed and said, Wow, thank you, Hashem, took it and was satisfied with their lot. Another one? Oh, there must be something better than this and bigger. And went and went and went. Middle of the road of the city, middle of the city. Oh, they're all the same. Okay, I guess I'll just the one that was not the Benani, there must be a bigger piece. Ah, there's a better property. There's a better house. There's a better wing. There's a better dress. There's better, there's better, there's better. Man. And they weren't happy with their lots. And so they exerted and exerted and exerted. They left their children. They left their husbands or they left their wives to go find something better. 
There's always another thing, another gadget, another, another. And the days pass. Trust me, I'm going to cry. Because I can't even believe my children are 21 and 18. And as much as I tried so hard to be the best that I could be for them, it's unbelievable how time flies so fast. And I remember one week, my daughter and I, and uh, had I learned this lesson before I went this way, but you know, uh, we were going shopping for a better something. And we went to this place, and we went to that place. And for a week and a half, we didn't find that better thing. And we ended up not doing it. But oh, how I regret those golden two weeks, almost. I have someone that was in my life, and it, it was a big lesson for me, early on. She had worked and worked and worked and worked and worked, and she would drop off her kids by me. And I didn't realize I didn't have kids that time. Thank God Hashem blessed me, but at that time. And I was happy. I loved children. I wanted 10 children, and we were married already like a year, and no children, and whatever. And, but after a while, I was wondering, she never told me she got a job. So what is she doing all this time? So I asked her, and um, she said, you know, she needs to fix up her house, and she, and she got this, and she got that, and she got this, and she got that. And that, you, you have to do that sometimes when you're moving. No judgment here. And, uh, and, but I remember the day that um, her husband lost a job almost a year later, and all that work ended up for nothing, and they had to move out of town. And I remember, oh my gosh, all that time. There was another story. <laughs> Esther Youngrice talks about heart-wrenching situation. A girl is really, really, like, been depressed since she was like eight years old that she could remember. And she's like 37 or something, not married yet, just not moving in her life. So Esther Youngrace tries to, you know, get to her and say, like, anything in your life, like, you remember, traumatic, like, anything? Like, where did this, where, what happened at this age eight? Oh my gosh, she says, I remember now. You'll never believe this. I was near my mom when she got this phone call. What? You're not coming tomorrow? I've been waiting. I've been packing. We're going to the Catskills. No way. You, you cannot. No, the other side. I can't come. Well, then please find me somebody. And she's going on to the children. I can't believe this. I can't. She's leaving and, and, not, and leaving me out like this. So she's really upset. Kids probably are very happy. But she gets another phone call. The phone call comes in. Oh, I found somebody. A friend of my friend said she could come. Oh, phew, the mother says. Okay, tell her to be here at 10 o'clock. Oh, yes. And she's celebrating. She found out. Her kids are watching this. This does not end here. Then, at the morning, when the, right before that new stranger maid, or house sitter, whatever you want to call it, nanny, comes, she takes all her candlesticks and her golden uh, jewelry, and she takes them all with the children, puts it in the safe, and says, I'm locking this. You never can trust these people. Puts it in. Bye! And she says, I remember that day. I felt crushed. Her jewels are more important than me? A stranger, she's leaving me? There's so many stories like this. <coughs> Where can we learn from the lesson of the table? To be satisfied with the little portion we have. Where can we make an effort? To not let our children feel so neglected. And I'm, I tell you, it was a challenge for me too. Even all for the L'Shem Shemaim reasons. Where there was classes, where there was writing. It was always a challenge. I'm not saying it's easy. Even for holy endeavors. How much less therapy will these kids happen to have to go to? How much less? 
So, this is the Shulchan. We got to investigate. I tell people, whenever you see a table, whenever you see water or a basin, remember the crying message of the Beit HaMikdash. And remember these in your day-to-day -day life, especially in relationships and how you can make your home so holy. So, next is the menorah. Okay, we all know what the menorah looks like because we're in Hanukkah, we, we celebrate Hanukkah over there. If you notice, there's steps going up to the menorah. And the way this is designed, and also the window, the way it was designed, where the menorah was placed, was opposite of the normal window. Normally windows are, conca are uh, the, it was in a concave format in order for light to go out. Because normally you have a window for the light to come in. So this represents our light in our house. It has to start first. And then we'll shine our light outside. You know, there's a halacha. If you don't have enough oil to light the menorah and it's Shabbos, which one do you choose? You would think, oh, oh once in eight days. I, you know, in, 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 in those eight days are bringing the Gan Eden lights of, uh, for only these eight days. So put off Shabbos. Shabbos goes every week. No. Shabbos lights takes precedence. Why? Because the Shabbos light represents, you want to be a light into the world? Great. But first be a light in your own house. How many times I've had children tell me, my parents are so nice, they're so well known in the community, but they shut the door and they're like, just not the same people they are on the outside. And it's very easy to be very nice on the outside, right? The male woman comes to the door. A minute later, you're like, <laughs> and open, hi, oh, thank you. Close it, <laughs> like in a, in a second. So we need to be a light in our own home. Now, one time I was in a, in a lecture with Rabbi Label Wolf, and he said, and I've been saying this my whole life, isn't it a shame that the outside world gets the best of you? The people that work, to bring the Parnassa in the house. The children that you were gifted with, you know how many people don't have children? Or God forbid, lose their children, God forbid? The ones that were responsible to raise up. I mean, as the Zohar teaches us, a woman comes down to be able to raise up her men. She doesn't have to come down into this world. Her purpose is to help him this time around. Meaning, I guess I didn't do it last time. And I was willing to come down again. That's why we women light the Shabbos candles, because we can elevate and bring the light out of everybody. But our number one starts at home. So if you notice the way the stairs were up to the menorah, this was also symbolic. Why? Because the menorah, Aaron could light the menorah, he could reach it. He didn't have to go up the stairs. Because each light of the menorah represented a different type of Jew, and meaning even a, maybe a different type of child, maybe the black sheep of the family. Some born like Avraham, a chesedik. Some born like Yitzchak, more gevura. Some born more wanting to be like Avraham and doing kindness. And some are more like Yitzchak, who studied more and was in the tent. So before we try to elevate each member of our family, the first step is get up those steps and elevate yourself. And not have a double standard. Let me tell you a story that happened to me. I actually was living in a town where this client of mine was near a supermarket that I go to. And the day before she was, like as if bringing me a watch, fix this child. I'm not a magician, I wish. 
I was trying to give her to understand, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to help you tolerate the slow process and understand this idea of raising children. I'll buy they will be perfect tzaddikim right now. But anyway, so I happened to hear her screaming out from the window. I called her right away the next day before our next appointment. I said, I have to see you first. And then I, I spoke with her. And I said, I said, you're expecting a child who has not a fully developed brain, doesn't have life experience, as the Alter Rebbe says, is all Yetzahara, till bar and bar mitzvah. Only at bas mitzvah does the godly soul enter the child's life. You're telling me to fix him when you have a fully developed brain and have your Yetzir Tov and life experience and I hear you not be coherent, you yelling and losing your cool. I don't want to shame you. Listen, we're all on our journeys, but understand that you cannot be so demanding that, that he be fixed and not be angry. And then she says, but this is different. I go, I go, oh, really? But he makes me upset. I'm like, wait a minute. So maybe what you're doing is making him upset. But you're the adult. You need to set the example. How could you get mad that he's getting mad? You're just showing him more of what you want him not to do. And as we go through this journey, we will have more and more tools of how to do it. Because the menorah represents, the oil represents oil of wisdom, chokhmah. The wick represents the body. And the menorah represents your whole being, all the Torah and mitzvahs that you do. So in order to be able to allow the wisdom to flow through in your body and really stay there, because if you put oil and a wick without a, a, some kind of vessel, what's going to happen? The oil is going to splatter, the wick is going to be flat, no light. But if you have the vessel and you have the wick and no oil, then the, the, the light, the spark of your soul basically that is represented by this oil and the shining light will not also make a light. So you need each component part of the menorah to be able to be a light. So the oil is the wisdom. But it doesn't stop there. Because many people learn, 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 learn. They even can say things by heart. And trust me, I've experienced many people like that along the way. But their behavior does not show what they know. And we talked about it, maybe some of you were in my other class. We see doctors that do surgeries and they, they know that the, the smoking caused lung cancer. And after they do the surgery, people of uh, my friends have told me, after the surgery that their relative had, they're smoking after the surgery. So they know the information, how many years, 12 years in college? And, but it didn't seep in. So the oil needs to seep in. And the only way to have it seep in is by Torah and mitzvahs, mainly through prayer and learning. And the whole component part of our Jewish religion is the whole step-by-step -step process by which this wisdom will penetrate. Mainly through meditation, his bonanus, reviewing, and let it seep deeper and sink in more and more so that we do become a light. Let me tell you a story. And when I heard this story, there was one message, but then I got a different message from it as well. There was a story of a rabbi who was uh, becoming very popular, and he was... Uh, um, kind of stealing away, not by him stealing away, but it just happened to be that people were drawn to his show and to his classes. And the other rabbi was upset. And so he started going with his Yetzirah and starting bad mouthing. And it was not a pretty scene in the town. One day the rabbi happened to fall down, the one who was the popular one. And it was a rainy, muddy day. And then the next moment, 
the other rabbi happened to pass by. And instead of reaching out to help pick this man up, he took mud and he threw it on him and said, you deserve this, and walked away. Now this man, the sadic that he was, stood up, ran to the guy and said, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. What did I do to have caused you to hate me so much? And he was with tears. The man was taken aback. Oh my gosh, he is holy. And it melted the, the animosity. And in fact, he started learning with this rabbi and he started also becoming Chabad Hasidus. So, in this story, sometimes you have to see what are you doing that's making the other one upset? Is your light diminished? Is it barely flickering? Is your anger or your sadness getting in the way of bonding and coming close? But the second message of this story, which I, it says like, anybody listening to the story would be like, what chutzpah? He's in the mud and you're taking more mud and splashing it on him? It's like, not normal. But basically, everybody's in the mud every day. Especially our little children. The teachers are not so nice. The bus driver bullying or pushing them around. The, the, the student, the bigger sister, the younger brother. Who knows? There's so much going on. Mud after mud after mud. They're in the mud. We have to have compassion and not throw more mud. But shine our light. We have to be careful. And, and stop from them being dug deeper into the hole of the challenging times they have growing up or even our spouses the finances the stress the inability to feel good about themselves because they're not accomplishing like the other these are all factors we have to consider and not let these circumstances of the way they're stuck as I say if a puppy is stuck underneath the car, you have compassion on them. They're stuck. You be the light. If someone was in an accident, God forbid, and you were able to move, and they were crying and screaming, I'm cold. Okay, so it's annoying, but they're suffering. You can move. You don't have their stuckness. Like So, so have compassion and rise above. Get rid of that ego. Burn away that wick, that, that yetzahara, the, the bodily temptation to be annoyed and angry and not shine your light. By the way, this class is usually about three or four weeks long. We're doing it in hopefully an hour. So I'm going to move to the next one. And after the menorah, ah, oh, we're getting to the gold. Uh, the mizbeach hazahav. And um, before you see the mizbeach hazahav, there was the Parochet. And this parochet had the angels uh, write uh, kind of like a, a video screen, kind of like snapshot these days or whatever, I don't know what, you know, where you can just instantly see what's going on behind the curtain. So when the Jewish people were, uh, you know, getting along, the angels faced each other, and when they were not getting along, they were turning away from each other. But it's interesting, when the destruction took place and the Romans actually were taking the artifacts out to show their victory, interesting that the angels were hugging each other, not just facing each other. Which is a lesson in life to us that it seems like it's a dark moment. It seems like God is not here. It's, he's mad at us and he's turning his face away from us. But in reality, it's really an act of love. Because when you're destroying something, it's for something better. Halakha says that you cannot destroy something unless you build something better in its place. So it was for our journeys to reach a higher state of spiritual existence by going through the darkness, just like someone running. And, and for the, I can imagine, let's say someone running from the 911, you know, burning towers and like almost something hitting them and almost the fire engulfing them, but they got out. 
how much they then love their life, how much they feel blessed. The little things that they couldn't do ended up affecting them in a good way because of that dark moment, because they appreciate so much more. And we'll get to that stage, please God, when the third Beit HaMikdash will be here. But I want to mention that the angels were looking down. Oh, oh, so I'm sorry, back to the, the, the parochas. So when the Romans were out there, they saw that, that the, through this uh, parochas that Hashem was hugging us, as it were. Because 22 years before, it was buried uh, uh, in the underground of the Beit HaMikdash when King Josiah knew and had the prophecy that it was going to be destroyed, the Beit HaMikdash, so he hid it. So we were able to see what was going under the hidden structure down in that chamber, how Hashem was really hugging us when this happened. And uh, this is a lesson in love and relationships. You know, sometimes we have to be strict. We can't say, yes, 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 we love you, yes, yes. We've got to have some firmness. But we have to make sure it's with love. We have to make sure that the child knows. Not with anger, not with uh, ignoring, not with making them feel lowly. How many times do we make a mistake? Do we want to, you know, Facebook Live, our mistake? Mm. You know, there, there was a teaching when you need to critique somebody and give criticism, there's three real rules to that. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Why? Because it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. There's a way to critique in a very subtle, soft way with embrace, with bonding, with love. It doesn't have to be with harshness. And, you know, Rambam says you can feign anger. But literally, Hasidus teaches us, really stay away from that because it could turn into anger. Instead, use compassion. Instead, use words of love. Instead, actually, maybe be quiet. And not speak if you're feeling, you know, on fire and upset. As the Pasuk says, in silence, righteousness to speak. Be silent. Then, take some time. Am I angry? Is my heart going like this? Is my stomach? Is my nose? No. Then I'm not going to talk now. Then maybe later, maybe 10 minutes, maybe even tomorrow, then speak about what upset you and do it wisely with softness and with love. So if you, we're going to have to conclude here soon, so I'm going to do this kind of fast. But if you notice this structure, there was three boxes, gold on the outside, inside was uh, wood, and, the, and on the top was the uh, inner yeah, mm -hmm. box that was also gold, and on the top were where the angels were. So the question is asked, are we trying to be cheap here? Like, why not make all three gold first? And if we're going to try to be cheap, then just do all two inside, you know, wood, and the outside just do gold. So the message is, we've worked so hard to get to this place, to be on the gold on the outside. Maybe in the beginning we were like faking it till we make it. We didn't really want to be kind to them. We didn't really want to help them. We just did it. We sacrificed our ego of, uh, and our desire of not to. We did it. Here now, we're already reaching the goal. It becomes more genuine. We really do have compassion. We really do make the extra effort to be more giving. And, and the inner uh, box has to relate to our inner thoughts. How many times people do behave beautifully on the outside, but inside, they're not doing so beautifully. Oh, I can't believe he did that. And oh, I'll show him and this and that. Or, and the, and the mind goes on and on. And they're not Hashem B'Simcha because they become sad, internally angry, internally, uh, f you know, festering. And thoughts actually increases your chances of your behaviors to follow suit. Because thoughts create emotions. So what we have to do is try our best to work on purifying our thoughts next. And then, as Rabbi Label Wolf in some of his classes have said, and we learn in Tanya, that our thoughts create angels. Our thoughts create 
energies. So if you're ruminating negative thoughts about someone, but making them the food, making them this, then it ends up happening that they get repelled. Because they have angels that meet up with your angels and they don't want to connect to you. They want to close the door. They want to go uh, into another room. They don't want to talk to you. So we have to purify in the inside and in the outside. And the, and the last message here is the wood, which represents the, the uh, wood uh, from the word uh, um, Achaia wood, which is from the shtus, from the word... Um, like folly. We even need to use all our foolishness and our cuteness. Also, L'Shem Shemayim and Techa Moya and Mamash, we get to the Holy of Holies within ourselves. Thank you for joining. I'm so happy all of you came here on a fast day. Thank you, Hashem, for giving me the strength today and a fast day to do this. And I bless you that you will reach new heights. And every time you see any of these, um, remember this messages. And then you can go on TorahAnytime.com. There's many weeks of these classes on the website there. And hopefully you'll learn even more than I gave you today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a rest of the fast. If anybody wants these or to email me at Miriam you shall me 18 at gmail.com or if anybody wants a mikvah checklist that is a new checklist to help people to go to the mikvah and do it accordingly it's never been done before where it has all the minutes because many times people don't know how much this how much that and I also have a lecture pamphlet uh, to give out. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I have to learn how to close this. Last time it was recorded. Do you know how to close this, anyone? Thank you. Bye. Easy, fast. How do you close this so I know for the future? She did a great job. Wonderful, wonderful. First, you have to move my wife.